I want to hear more about the first thing you talked about, which was transitioning a gym from what sounded like more or less a place to train to a business establishment. And I want to tell a brief story and then you can riff on that and tell me your experience. So um, I started the gym Revolution Parkour. I started that company in 2008 and then opened a gym in 2010. And I designed a facility based around optionality and versatility. And what I noticed at the time was every other gym that I saw in the parkour world was built around jamming as many obstacles as possible into the gym. And I didn't feel like it developed a flow. Um, you're the first person I've ever hear talk about designing a gym for classes or for students. And I think that that's actually a paradigm shift and a level up in the way people think about gyms. And I think it's happened probably naturally, but also it wasn't intuitive in the beginning. So that's my perspective on it. But but tell me yours and can you delve into more details about how the first gym wasn't optimized for classes and then now you're thinking with that mindset? Totally. So the first gym, um, a way that I have described it in the past was it was the, oh, where'd you go? <laughs> it was the- Yeah, I'm going to focus on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, the first gym was the Taj Mahal of, parkour build out you know like it was this giant massive climbable structure of, of wood and plywood and all that um and to us it was it was sick um and you know the kids when they get in there for their first couple of times it's cool to them too it's this giant thing they can climb on it they can jump off the high thing into the foam um but you know as you progress and you go months by months by and you have to pay your bills you just kind of realize like man we can only fit you know, like two classes into this at the time it was a 6,000 square foot facility. You know, if we got real creative, we can squeeze this third class in here, but that one class is going to be like, obviously the worst area in the gym. Um, and then during open gym, you know, like we're constantly having to help kids like figure out how to get up onto stuff. And it wasn't intuitive for them to get from ground level to most of the funner areas in the gym. Um, and we just like didn't anticipate that when we were designing it. Um, I was 19 at the time. So literally we had my mom's cutting board with like a bunch of modeling clay and we were just like making cool stuff and being like, oh yeah, this giant thing's gonna be awesome. But at that time, I absolutely wasn't thinking about who my real target audience was. Uh, not just my desired audience, my like the audience that's actually gonna help me pay the bills and who the person is that I'm actually trying to teach parkour to neither of those things were like accurately targeted in my head. Um, so yeah, as we, as we progressed, we learned that you can't just like build giant cool structures. You have to think about how much open space do you have for classes and for the warmups um, so that your modular you know, equipment can be designed in those open spaces so that you can teach specific things about your curriculum. Um, if you do have larger areas like a foam pit retainer, like how do the littlest kids in your gym interact with that? Um, do they just like show up and constantly ask your coaches for help? Like, are you guys going to help them climb on stuff? Um, all of these, we just totally didn't have in the beginning, but we evolved it over time. Um, and what I mentioned a little bit ago was the, the standards for each coaching zone. Um, this kind of ties into that as well. So once you, once you're a parkour program, a gym specifically, or a teaching program, and you you know your curriculum, ideally you have your, you know, you, you have a client journey, you know what beginners learn, what intermediate students learn. Um, once you have that, you should be able to look at your different coaching zones. Let's say you have three or two coaching zones. Um, if you expect your coaches to be learning or to be teaching wall climbs or laches, like two of the harder things to set up, um, you can't waste 20 minutes of class, like dragging in giant heavy walls or having your coaches like screwing and unscrewing piping, um, like maybe before class, but if you have eight, 10 classes in a row in a day, that's not sustainable. So if you design your coaching areas to already have the most difficult to set up elements in them, uh, every single coaching zone, and then the rest of your gym, you can have it modular. You can have it, you know, easily movable. Now you've optimized your entire gym for ease of coaching. So your coaches want to stick around and they're not throwing out their backs. Um, but now your kids are like 
it doesn't matter which coaching zone they go into. So they're not disappointed if they go into the obviously lame one, um, but they can learn your curriculum. They can go through your client journey and your space is optimized for that. Um, and that, that has huge benefits as far as like staff retention, um, how well taught your classes are perceived to be by the kids and the parents. Um, and frankly, it can save you a lot of money if you think about this in the design phase instead of just building my mistake, the Taj Mahal of parkour. And then at the end of the day, you realize that you kind of got to tear it down to like get a better design going. This is fascinating. So I have never heard someone talk about gyms this way. And It's different, man. It's different. Like I, I think, I think the gym mentality. When I see most gyms, it seems to me that they're like, "Oh, let's make really cool obstacles," and it's designed from like a tracer standpoint. Like, "Oh, we need concrete. Okay, we need laches. We need a bar area." But it almost sounds like you're almost speaking in what I would almost deem some type of. I want to say fractal, although it's it's not accurate. It's like. You said something about having like lashes available in each coaching zone. And so you're thinking long term. Does does the does the design start from the curriculum? Or does it like what's the what's the essence then? Like what would be the foundation? Is the first foundation like what we're gonna teach and then let's let's design it built on that teaching? Or is it more like a different way? Totally. So the ground level foundation is what is your company's mission? Who the heck are you trying to teach? Um, and we're talking about gyms right now. Like if we transitioned this to a clothing company or whatever other kind of parkour entrepreneurial mindset, it all of it has this ground floor for how you design the next step. Who are you trying to teach or who are you trying to serve and what's your mission? So at Freedom in Motion and like I would argue most parkour gyms, you're trying to teach people parkour who don't already know parkour yet. And more often than not, that's going to be kids, you know, ages seven to 12, you know, like four to 13, whatever it is. Um, obviously parkour gyms love to get teens and adults in there, but if we just look at the industry and we look at, you know, who's paying the bills, um, it's parents with kids in that age. So if you know that you want to teach them parkour, but not just teach them, have them fall in love with parkour in the way that you did, I did, you know, all the, all of us OG parkour athletes get that like, that je ne sais quoi, that thing that really made you fall in love with parkour. You're trying to give them that and you know their age group. Now you have a basis for designing what your gym ought to look like. You know, is it for kids? Is it for beginners? Is it for high level athletes? Um, that's the basis of what to then design.